I've done enough public speaking that I've kind of forgotten how many times I've been on stage or on podcasts or making any sort of public appearance. It's been a real privilege. Uh, I feel very lucky that I've been in front of so many audiences and spoken about a wide range of topics. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about the behind the stage experience and what I've picked up over the years talking about my strange, unusual subjects and what else has happened along the way. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Peter Healy, and thanks to Chris Erlinson for the idea, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Public speaking encompasses a whole range of activities involving talking to others en masse as part of a panel or maybe pre-recorded. Any situation, really, where you're talking for the benefit of an audience. That audience can be very small, a handful of people. Or it could be huge, thousands of people, even tens of thousands extending over years. And part of that whole experience is preparing yourself to go in front of everyone. If you ask around to folks who make a living or make it a part of their living to do public speaking, they'll all have opinions, places they like the most, situations they prefer, situations they <laughs> frankly can't stand. And each person will give you hints, tips, what to do in their opinion when you find yourself in that situation. I'm going to give you mine, but I have to stress the most important tip that I can possibly give you is that nobody is exactly you. You have a character, a spirit, a unique way of looking at the world. And what's probably to your benefit, besides just learning rote ideas on how to be in front of an audience, is to look internally at what makes you you and what people find the best in you and get that on stage. No amount of suggestions and stories I give you would ever top that. I've been comfortable speaking in public for a very long time. I was an incredibly quiet kid before 15. But after 15, when I moved in with my dad and had a chance to reinvent myself at a high school, I found that I loved being in front of crowds. I was able to stand in front of 300 people and run for class president and stand in front of 1,200 people and run for school president, not with any intention of winning, but just because I liked the idea. By the time I got to my senior year, I was the school announcer, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance every morning. Nothing about any of it made me nervous. A talk and presentation that I gave at DEF CON 7 in 1999, where I spoke about textfiles.com. Even though there had been previous hacker conventions all the way through the 90s, and I'd been invited to many of them, I wasn't comfortable being a target like that. But by 1999, whoever was running textfiles.com was already a target, so I didn't see much harm in it. And what I found was that I loved everything about public speaking. I loved watching people assembling, knowing that they were all assembling to listen to me. I loved the sound of the crowd waiting. I could hear them preparing to listen to whatever I was saying. And if I was lucky, I could hear someone talking about me and introducing me to the audience. I loved the fact that the audience felt like a wave. I could feel the emotion of the audience swelling up, and I would paddle along with them, adding more and more details to my story until, sometimes completely unscripted, I would crack a reference or a joke, and it would land. It would land as easily as if I had thrown a bowling ball into a bathtub, just a splash and a crash everywhere. And that was something I had done to them. And then slowly afterwards build up to the next crescendo and the next one. 
to me, public speaking engagements are like concerts or songs. You are on stage to bring knowledge and bring information, but you are also bringing entertainment. A public speech, one where it's one person talking through to a large audience, is one of the most inefficient ways of transferring information that you could imagine. You have a single person moving through a thread, and there's no time to focus on one subject. You have to walk a path, going from one subject over to another, and hopefully, if you've written it right or if your knowledge of it is sufficient, hit some sort of theme that people walk out somewhat enlightened. But if you take the speech and transcribe it down, it won't be very many words, not compared to what someone could have read in that amount of time. There's a pretty standard blog entry that's been around for around 15 years now, pointing out how incredibly inefficient podcasts are, that if you take the words and put them out, it'll be a few paragraphs, but you had to listen to it for 20 or 40 or 60 minutes. And the conclusion they reach is that at the end, you're left wanting, that you could have gotten so much more out of that time, but you in some way wasted it listening to a podcast. This is adorable fodder to make hay with, but in fact, it's not accurate. Because podcasts and public speaking are performances. They bring with them, if done right, not just a feeling of information transferred, but emotions lived, humor felt, humanity laid bare. Now, don't get me wrong. I've sat through speeches where it is clear that the person is reading from pre-written paragraphs, and none of it has been tested on an audience. There's no pauses for their reactions. There's no improvisation built in in case you notice that you're losing them or that they want to know more about what you're talking about. But I've been to so many more that leave me literally breathless, stunned, mouth agape at what I've just heard. As I said when I started, there's a whole range of performances and events that might present public speaking. You might not always get the experience of something called the green room. The green room is where the speaker or speakers are kept off stage until their moment to step in front of everyone. Some events, some places, don't have anything like that. The speaker just turns, grabs a microphone, or raises their voice and says, Hello, everyone. I want to talk to you about something. And everybody slowly quiets down and listens to whatever it is that you have to say. In other situations, there's music and slides and hosts that introduce everybody to what's going to go on. In those situations, there's almost always some sort of green room. It'll be a not incredibly fantastic room that has drinks and tables and somebody in there to help you if you need any assistance or to do errands for you. In some cases, it's as simple as a table behind the stage door. In others, it can get incredibly complicated with a press area where reporters will interview you before you go out or after you go out on stage and people who are running all sorts of services for you, along with drinks and food and snacks that are as impressive as anything you've seen at that conference. Part of what Chris wanted to know was my best and worst experiences, and I can say clearly that the number one experience was Webstock in New Zealand, where I was flown out for 10 days, taken to a beautiful house on the side of a cliff where we were given food and gifts and given the chance to hang out together and told that they had all of their faith that we would give excellent speeches. In the green room, not only was it beautifully appointed, but they had actually had a local maker create a special speaker-only ice cream and kept it in freezers for us to have whenever we wanted. Sorry to everyone who's been kind enough to have me speak. That one's going to be hard to top. 
A somewhat close second, of course, would be the XOXO Festival, who really wanted all of their speakers to feel comfortable and happy and attended to. And the green rooms at the various venues that XOXO has been held at have really shown how much the organizers give in almost every detail of what they do. I try to go into a speech leaving people better for having spent the 30 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half with me. I don't want anyone to regret their time. The fact that I tend to use stories in my speeches doesn't get universal appeal. So occasionally I'll see people give negative reviews because they wanted a, a rote recitation of facts, very specific outlines about what to do in the subject that I'm talking about. And I'm not going to do that. So while it's a shame, I don't feel bad. In the many other events and conferences and places that I've spoken, they all have various degrees of how they treat their speakers. Some pay, some don't. Some give you gifts, some don't. A uh, few will pay for your travel and your lodging, while others are simply able to give you a discounted ticket. I've had places make me pay to attend and speak and then use me as part of their promotion. Conventions are an incredible financial risk, and trying to cut down on costs is just part of what they have to do. There's really no indication how good or bad your speaker treatment is going to be based on the event. I've been at events with thousands of people and not really enjoyed being a speaker or found how they treated speakers to be a little less than good, while other small conventions that barely can keep things together have put everything into making me feel welcome and being there as I asked for questions or needed something printed. Even DEF CON, which by the time I was attending was already thousands of people crammed into a hotel, had a situation where I needed to print out something on paper, and Jeff Moss, the organizer himself, walked with me to his room, to his printer, to get it done. I always appreciated that there was this whole event going on with so many people milling about, and here I was with the organizer for about 20 or 30 minutes, just getting over to the room to get some stuff done. Maybe that's part of why DEF CON's stuck around so long. In the green room, in the area reserved for speakers, there's a whole range of things that can happen, especially when you mash together people from all walks or all areas of an industry. And so that's how I found myself in a green room with the actor Rain Wilson at South by Southwest. And Rain Wilson had sent people after my online cat years earlier. He had been making threats for some sort of comedic value, I hope, uh, against my cat, but it was leading to people making death threats against us and even to a scare where I thought my cat had been kidnapped because he had hurt himself and hid away in the house. And I was emotionally distraught for hours until he pulled himself out of whatever tiny space he had crawled into in fear. And I've never forgiven him for that. And I had an opportunity of a lifetime to be in a room with him and confront him. I decided that wasn't the way to go. That while I still think Rain Wilson is a sociopathic, self-absorbed jerk, taking him to task backstage probably wasn't going to solve any of the problems that I had. On the other hand, I was more than happy to yell at Joy Ito after he insulted one of my friends in his speech, dismissing everything my friend was going to speak about next, and frankly doing so in the middle of a speech that I found really poorly constructed and incredibly poor quality for the audience that it had commanded. And I have to say, in terms of hobbies and interests, uh, screaming at Joy Ito is way up there. But in the end, 
quality of the individual green rooms and how well the staff treats speakers or provides us with goodies, and even the audiences, are the experiences in the green room or just out of it meeting up with people who either know your work or just saw you talk on stage. That, for me, has always been the most rewarding. One of the talks I gave about my heart attack ended with me walking through the audience into the lobby, and a minute or two later, one of the organizers, with tears in her eyes, came up and hugged me for a while. So I knew I'd probably done a pretty good speech, and it had hit its emotional mark. But actually, the most meaningful experience I've had pre or post any of my speeches was something that happened at Webstock in New Zealand. Not immediately after I spoke, but in a party for the wrap-up of the event. They had rented out an entire huge lounge, and people were all uh, making speeches and playing music and having a great time. And as things wound down, I found myself speaking to a number of people who had been waiting patiently until they had a chance to hang out with me and ask questions and give their own ideas. And there was one gentleman there who was talking to me, and he was telling me how he had also come from New York, and he had been living in New York City when he and his girlfriend uh, decided that they were going to move to New Zealand because a job had come up. And so they had traveled to Seattle and were preparing to go to New Zealand for his work when the 9-11 attacks happened. And when he told me that, he looked at me, someone who was from New York, and I could see something building in him, and he looked at me more closely, and then he started to cry. Just a wordless sobbing, and I gave him a hug, and I held him in this restaurant while people were filtering away, and just let him cry. He was crying because he had not been able to to share any of this feeling with anyone in New Zealand. There wasn't anybody who would understand like he felt I understood coming from New York. And he cried for a while and then slowly recovered, wiped his eyes, and he thanked me. He didn't have to apologize. He didn't have to explain. I entirely got it looking at his eyes. I'm going to be very hard-pressed to ever top that experience. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to Emilio Oliveira, James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Scott McGrady, Scott Roseanne, and Wayne Arthurton, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. It is far beyond the range of this episode to give anybody advice about how to run a convention or how to treat your speakers, but I can summarize it that the speakers are in many ways one of the main reasons people come. If you've got a vendor floor, that's great. That makes you a flea market. It's the people that you put in your announcements that you feel will draw crowds, will make people want to attend, that I like to think will inspire you to treat with the most respect and the most communication. And as a speaker, you're given an incredible privilege to meet an audience, to speak in front of them, and have all of these folks give their time to hear what you have to say. I think respect comes from all the sides, the organizers, the speakers, the audience. And anybody who forgets that forgets it at their peril. <laughs>